We told you yesterday that the best kind of life, that abundant life, is found only in Jesus. Jesus is abundant life, okay? That's what we said yesterday. That's what we're going to keep saying. It's the truth. Jesus offers abundant life, but here's what you need to hear today. If you get nothing else, listen to this. Jesus offers abundant life, but abundant life is not an easy life. You hear that, students? Leaders, Jesus offers abundant life, but abundant life is not an easy life. Have you ever had one of those moments, like mountaintop experiences, where it's just everything seems good, you're on top of the world, it, things couldn't be better? Right? Raise your hand, you know, maybe you score a goal in the big game, you make the shot, you play well at the competition, you do something, you perform well on the stage, whatever it is, things are going perfectly. When I was in high school, we took this trip with my youth group to Colorado for this adventure trip. It was between your junior and senior year, and so you had to be going into your senior year to go on this trip, and we would go whitewater rafting, we went rock climbing and rappelling, and it was this leadership trip, and it was just incredible. On the way back from that trip, they would always take us to a secret location for fun as the last thing before we came home, and they kept it a secret every year, I don't know how, from the next generation of students that was going to go through. And so it was always like, we're going to go do this fun thing. And so we come back from this week, and it's incredible. We're having so much fun. And we stop in this little town in Colorado that has an alligator farm. Okay? I know you're thinking, yeah, of course, Colorado, alligators. So we stop at this alligator farm, and if you, you can imagine as you walk into, like, what an alligator farm should be, you know, very, very protective, like the, the alligators are very separate. It's basically a chain link fence between you and this you know, swamp pit of 12-foot alligators. That's, that's the amount of protection that's involved. And at one point in this trip, in this alligator farm visit, you walk in and you can go sit on the back of an alligator. And alligators have these, this part in the back of their mouths where you can hold their mouths open. And so you could, you could walk out and, and what would happen is this guy who didn't wear any shoes and he like had like a, one of those white tank top shirts on that hadn't been washed ever. And so... Um, he would, would wrestle an alligator. They also teach alligator wrestling there. He would wrestle an alligator out of the swamp and plop it down, and then he would sit on it, and you would go with, you know, your, like your girlfriend or your whoever, and you'd go sit on the alligator, and you'd hold the mouth open, and you'd smile, and then, you'd, then he would come back and sit back on the alligator, and then you would walk away, right? So right before I'm about to go sit on the back of this alligator to hold his mouth open to get a picture taken, my friend Matt Spiel who, you don't need to know his last name, but that's his last name. He is the skinniest human being you've ever met. Like, in high school, if he was soaking wet and 100 pounds, he had had three meals that day. Like, he was so skinny that in college, we made, uh, like, one of those mock, uh, you guys remember those compassion pictures? Where it's like a, a picture of a starving kid, you know? And we made one of Matt, like, because he looked emaciated, which is probably wrong. I'm sorry, it, it did happen, though, okay? That's how skinny Matt was. And Bubba weighs like 300 pounds. So Bubba's the one who is sitting on this alligator until you come and take your picture, and then he comes back and sits on the alligator. Right before I go up, it's Matt's turn. And so they say to Matt, hey, Bubba's like, I don't know, he has to go do something else in the swamp with the alligators. So he says, hey, Matt, why don't you be the person to sit on the alligator to weigh it down? And I'm like, this is the person that you chose for this, like, you know, I'm not into body shaming, but, like, let's just be realistic about physics. So Matt is like, sure, yeah, I'll sit on the back of this alligator. So he gives him about three seconds of instruction, and the only thing that he tells Matt is, whatever happens, don't get off his back. Because if you do, he'll turn around and he can eat you. And so Matt's like, oh, you know, okay. So he's sitting on his back. I get on, I get my picture, and I'm nervous, and it seems like, okay, this is going well. And I'm, I start to, like, walk out of the chain link fence area. And then Matt is on the alligator. And the alligator, you know, I don't know. These aren't smart animals. But it realizes the difference between 300 pounds and 90. And so what does it do? It starts to move. And Matt, who has been thoroughly trained for three seconds, what does he do? He jumps off of that thing immediately. And it runs off. And the guy, Bubba, who's in the swamp is like, oh, this is a problem. So he's going over. And by this time, one of the adult leaders, you know, there's always this one adult leader who's always concerned for the safety of all the students. She's just crying. She just assumes Matt is dead. Okay. She didn't stop crying until we got back to Arizona. So, so she's, she's crying. Matt is like there and he's, you know, could get eaten. But also there's Bubba who's saying like, we need to go get the alligator. And so he runs over 
And I'm right behind Matt, kind of like watching, and just like, I'll push Matt down if I have to to get out, you know, like, um, and, and I'm kind of like watching to see what happens, and Bubba rushes over, and he's, he looks back at Matt, and he says, Matt, come on, I need your help to, to get this alligator back over here. And Matt looks back at me, and I just go, and, and he looks back at Bubba, and he runs after this alligator, and they wrestle it back, and he died. He lost his legs. That's not true. He lived. Everything was fine. Um, but he should have died. He should have died. Listen. Listen, following Jesus, following Jesus is, is the most incredible, joyful adventure you can take with your life. I promise you it's abundant life. But you cannot misunderstand. Abundant life does not mean an easy life. When you follow Jesus, you will face scary things and hard things and terrible things. And he will be with you. But you will not escape those terrible, hard, difficult, scary things. We see it in Psalm 23. David writes, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. You could also translate this word evil as harm. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, this word valley of the shadow of death, literally you could translate it as the gloomy, dark place of death. It is darkness and it is death. Abundant life is not an easy life because you will face opposition. David did. We read, or we talked about 1 Samuel chapter 16 when David gets called and anointed by Samuel to become the king of Israel. And then right after that, what does he do? Of course, he rides on a, on a horse into Jerusalem and everyone celebrates him. No, he goes back to the shepherd field to deal with smelly sheep. And then in 1 Samuel chapter 17, David goes and he's still shepherding the sheep and he goes and takes food to his older brothers who get to go fight in the battle against the philistines and when he goes he sees this giant nine foot tall guy named goliath abundant life is not an easy life and so he he sees goliath calling out all the nation of israel all the soldiers saying i am going to defy you and your god i will kill anyone and we will enslave you israelites and no one wants to go fight the nine foot tall Philistine. But David shows up and he says, As surely as the Lord lives, who is this uncircumcised Philistine who stands and defies the Lord's army? He will not have it. And he knows he's called to abundant life. But abundant life is not an easy life. And so he faces this giant. Read the story, 1st Samuel chapter 17 in your small group. This word that we see in Psalm 23, the valley of the shadow of death, it occurs 18 times in the Hebrew Bible, 18 times. Ten of those 18 times are in the book of Job. Have you ever read the book of Job? It's about this guy who is so faithful to God with his life, with his resources, with everything that he has. He's living, you could easily call it, an abundant life. And then Job gets tested. God allows for this Satan to attack and oppose Job. And the first thing he takes is Job's family. And the second thing he takes is Job's wealth. And the third thing he takes is Job's health. An abundant life is not an easy life. You might lose family and you might lose wealth and you might lose your health following Jesus. Following Jesus, abundant life is not an easy life. It reminds me of one of my heroes in the faith, uh, my friend Braden. I met Braden between his, um, the summer between his sophomore and his junior in high school. And uh, when he was a freshman in high school, his mom got diagnosed with a form of cancer and it was inoperable and she was, uh, was not going to recover. And so she came home and she was in hospice care at their house. And, um, and I met Braden and when I was talking to him about kind of hearing his story one time, he told me that when he was a freshman in high school, 14 years old, his mom, an incredible faithful follower of Jesus, and when, when he was in high school, he knew his mom was going to die. 14 years old, freshman year. What are you dealing with in freshman year? And he said that one of the things he remembers most about that time is that when he would, when he was sitting in class, and you know how somebody would come and 
knock on the door of the classroom, and they'd say, oh, they'd bring a note to the teacher, and the teacher would read the note and then say, oh, you know, Susan, you got to go to the dentist, or, uh, you know, Tim, you got to go to practice, or you're excused to leave, or this or that. Braden told me that every time he heard that knock on the door, he thought it was a note telling him that his mom had died. Every single time. If you follow Jesus, you are not getting an easy life, but you are getting an abundant life. The reason it's not easy is because you will face opposition. The other reason that it's not easy to follow Jesus is because you will not just face opposition, you will face temptation, distraction, seduction. You see, when... David talks about this valley of the shadow of death. He also says, for you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Now, what is a rod for? It's to protect from the opposition that's faced. But what's the staff for? It's to grab the sheep by the neck and yank them back into the fold. Sometimes the opposition that you're going to face, sometimes the difficulty that you will face in following Jesus won't be because of opposition you face from the outside. It will be because of your own temptation and seduction. 2 Samuel chapter 11, David goes up on a roof, and it's the time when kings are supposed to go off to war, but instead David goes up on his roof and he looks and he sees a woman bathing, and that shifts the course of his life from faithfulness and obedience to a life of difficulty and pain, loss and tragedy. The abundant life is not an easy life. It's not an easy life because you will face opposition, and it's not an easy life because you will face temptation. It reminds me of my friend Jacob. He was a a junior in high school, and he he was at a COI move, and he felt the call of God on his life to go to serve in ministry. That was what he felt. He was like, God's calling me into ministry, and that's not for everybody, right? That's not a more holy calling than than, um, getting paid to work as any other job. It's It's not better, but he felt called by God to do that. And then he came home and told his parents, and they said, that's not a good idea. You're not going to make any money. Uh, your life's going to be difficult. No, 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 no. You need to continue your plan to go into business school. And Jacob came home, and instead of pursuing the calling that he felt that God had placed on his life, he did what his community of people, his friends and his family told him he should do. And I saw him a few years ago, a year ago, two ago, maybe two years ago, and and I I, I just happened to run into him at a tailgate. I said, hey man, how are you doing? I I deeply care about him. I I don't care that he didn't go into ministry because of what it means for me. Like, I I just want him to live an abundant life. All your youth pastor, all your leaders, all they want for you is an abundant life. That's all they want for you. But listen, Jesus is the only way to an abundant life. And I can tell from my conversation with Jacob, he was not living an abundant life. It's true that if you follow Jesus, you might make less money. You might go places you don't imagine you want to be. You might do things that you never thought you'd do. It might be harder. You might lose more. But I promise you, it is an abundant life. Do not excuse or confuse an abundant life. For an easy life. So what is abundant life? When you're facing this difficulty, when you're facing this pain, what does abundant life mean? It means what he says here in Psalm 23, verse 4, you are with me. God is with you in your pain. He's with you in your valley. He's with you when he first calls you, like he's with Moses in Exodus chapter 3. And Moses says, God, I can't do what you're calling me to do. And and God says, "Uh, don't worry, I'll be with you. He's with you in those moments where you need to be rescued. Isaiah 45 talks about the rescue and that God is with his people and will restore them. Matthew chapter 1, Jesus is born and he is called God with us because he saves his people from their sin. God will rescue you, not just from the opposition you face on the outside. God will rescue you from your own sin and destruction. He's with you. It reminds me of one of my mentors, a guy named Bob. 
Bob also got a form of cancer, and it was inoperable, and he had cancer, and, and he's an older man, and he had a granddaughter one day, and he was watching her, and, and she was learning how to spell, and so she was sitting at the kitchen counter, and Bob was just sitting there reading a book, and he was an expert, um, had spent his whole life studying the book of Revelation, studying scripture, a biblical scholar, a theologian, and he's got this granddaughter, and she's asking him, Papa, how do you spell cat? And, you know, he would spell cat for her, and she would write it on her piece of paper with her crayons, and then, and then she would say, Papa, how do you spell dog? And he would spell dog for her, and he, he was going through all these things, and he's reading his book, and he's loving being in the presence of his granddaughter, but he's also not paying too much attention to her, because, you know, they're little and boring. And so, he, he finally, she asked, Papa, how do you spell cancer? And she knows he hasn't, so he spells it out for her, and, and she says, Papa, can God heal you from this cancer that you have? And so now he puts down his book and he starts to talk to her. He says, yeah, yes, God can heal me from this cancer. Papa, will, will God heal you from this cancer? And the answer is absolutely yes. But maybe only resurrection because here's the deal god is with you in your sin he's with you in the opposition that you face he's with you in the seduction that you are tempted to follow and he is with you in the valley of the shadow of death father i pray for these students